So today I'm going over um, adding winds while migrating sites. And as I was telling the clay, this is going to be both generic and then a lot of the Drupal specific stuff's down at the end. Um, so this will be applicable for no matter what CMS you're using, looking at, coming from, working on. A lot of this has been garnered from years of different systems and different places I've been at. And most lately, I've been at Georgia Tech with the College of Design. So I'm the senior app developer for them. Um, I've been, as I was mentioned, I've been in sports, down over at Turner, uh, medicine, government, education, nonprofit, religious, all sorts of stuff. So run the Bart gamut, gamut of it. So if you've got specific questions on areas, feel free. I've probably worked in the area. To give you an idea of us, we have five schools, uh, seven research centers, even though two of them still have lab in their name, and a whole bunch of labs that are funded, like 12 or 14 now is what we're up to. We've just added several, which is really nice. Uh, backstory for us is that we have one-stop shop. So I'm all the communications technology guy, training folks. We have a full-time communicator who's our director. She's really good at doing, pushing new stories or doing interviews with people and pulling the stories out of them. And then we finally got an editorial type person who all she does is work with our research centers and one of our schools who has too many people but not enough funding yet to pull that stuff together as well. So what we end up doing a lot is trying to build our new show off uh, the content because we've ended up with a whole lot of content techno babble is what we found. So you have uh, you know, huge, wonderful research getting funded. And they like to use the same phrases like the built environment. And everyone's like, well, what does that mean? Because you've used it five different ways in the last five sentences. So that's part of the process we're going over too, that you know, what are we doing with this as we're rebuilding sites? So what this presentation is not about is the actual migrate module itself. It's pretty much everything around, about, and towards, and near it, and what you do to decide to do with it, but not the migration itself, because there's a whole bunch of places that are really, really, really good for this. And here's some examples. As I was telling Clay, I'll post the slides. All the links will be available. Uh, work had me up here until just a couple minutes before, so I didn't get to post it beforehand. But uh, from DrupalCon Vienna and Baltimore, they had several good that migrate everything, migrate all the stuff. Uh, Evolving Web, I believe, is doing one of the trainings this weekend, too. Um, they've done some stuff at Georgia Tech with us, so I know them. They, uh, they're, uh, Susanna is really great with that. One of the things that, two of the ones I do highlight, though, are that for the CSV module and the feeds instead of going through migrate, the CSV module is wonderful because if you are coming from another system, or you're getting an export from a really, really old system and all you have is title, publication date, here's your content field, a link to an image, whatever. A lot of times I've seen those exported from Cascade and stuff where it's, oh, here's your Excel file. You can import those. You know, it's not the best, it's not wonderful, but you can massage the stuff, you can go through it, and you can pull it in as normal data. It'll create your page nodes, all like that. So I do highlight that. And then one of the ones that we run into is that our old system on Drupal 7 on campus relied on the feeds module to help pop, uh, propagate news and events around campus. It's not over on eight yet, so this has been one of the ways we've been exploring using repetitive migrations with a, a unique identifier, so UUID on the news and events. It reads it in, hey, it's there, let me just update it, that sort of thing. So it makes sense. Uh, there's a link for the Drupal 7 stuff too. Uh, I do try to do a little bit back and forth to 7 and 8 because we do support both. So what we are going to cover, and as you see, there's a theme with images soon. Um, why do we have to do migrations? Because, of course, that's the main thing. Uh, getting editorial and stakeholder buy-in for anything added to it that you want to do for the process, especially for extending or figuring out what you want to add to make this a more worthwhile endeavor. Um, design and presentation changes, because, of course, you've got the legal side, you've got accessibility, you've got usability, you've got UX testing, and anything you can do at the front end makes a whole lot better on the far end and, and maintenance. And increasing content uptake, so you kind of combine all those together, your users have a better experience, they visit your site more, they use your data more, you get more recruitment, sales, whatever you need. And then, uh, again, accessibility and legal issues. If you're building and moving stuff anyway, cover your butt. Um, some of it it's makes it for more usable for the UX and UI, and it also makes sure that you don't have legal issues down the road. So anything you, you can anticipate now, why not? And then a few fun little things, both for playing with it and seeing if uh, what you can do with your site, how you can speed it up, make it more fun, make it more interactive for folks, without going over the top. And sometimes it's just things on the back end to make it easier for you. So, why, oh why do we have to deal with migrations? And this was almost my puppy because, well, he was about to get fixed for this week and we had to delay it. So he was about to get the martini outfit for Halloween this week, but he didn't. So, the biggest reason, you've got obsolete technology. Doesn't mean it's broken, doesn't mean it's bad, but you're running out of institutional knowledge. You're running out of support. Drupal 6 is dead, you know, that sort of thing. Where it doesn't mean it's bad or it's necessarily broken, but 
you've got nowhere to go, and if something happens, you don't have a recourse, because you can't say, oh, it's still being patched anymore, and there goes your legal shield for, hey, we did all we could. So all those sorts of instances. Um, new initiatives. So as we're talking about, if you have a new institute, corporate-wide branding, or here's the new technology, move off these other five to 10 different systems you're using, you know, consolidates cost, helps with containment, helps cross-training, gives you, <laughs> for those of us that aren't single-stop shops, people you can fall back on, so if you take a vacation or get sick or something like that, you know, they can farm out some support for each other. So those happen lots. Uh, old project given new life. This one just happened to us and will come up in a minute again. You have a site that's been dead for five, six years. A professor comes back from visiting overseas and suddenly, oh look, I have funding again and something that we were about to archive long term. Oh, can we update this now? And it was, can we have it done in about three hours? Uh, and it's completely flat site. So we were like, well, by the number of changes you want to do, I could easily move it into something else and make this much easier long term. So another reason. And then of course the old and goody, you got hacked. So number one would be, hope you have backups and can recover to a known good point, but then figure out why you got hacked. Was it the underlying technology? Was it embedded code? Was it cross-site scripting? Was it a fault of the system or user error or login or you know, whichever? Mostly you end up coming back to having to upgrade something and a lot of times, especially if it's an older system, they say, why don't you just upgrade and migrate over to the current new one? You know, each, again, uh, each instance will be varied and up to what your corporation has. So the unicorn, as I was mentioning, this is the idyllic, I have to migrate a site. It's ideally 10 pages or less. There were flat files. The one we're dealing with was even before Dreamweaver. It had a header and a footer that they literally were manually copying and pasting. You could tell when they did, and they would skip a couple lines and move it down, and it was this. So literally, they wanted to add an extra page at the top, and this is with it in there. This is after we did it. And I looked at it, and it took me a minute just to realize I'm looking at a site that I haven't, a sort of type of code I haven't touched in years because it's straight plain HTML, nothing fancy, no server side includes, no nothing. It was seven pages, an archive page, and everything included. And I said, okay, if we have to do more than change one page, I can spend just as much time moving it into WordPress and be done than having to ever touch the site again and go manually eight pages at a time to edit it. This was an easy sell. Give me two hours to do all this. Your grad student can edit the pages through the interface, be done. These almost never pop up anymore, so this floored me when it came up last month. So this, I like these. These are quick, self-contained. They come and ask me, I say, sure. But I never expect these because, well, we don't have them. So the biggest single issue with migrations, they need it now, they have their own time scale, and you have to figure out how to get more time or buy in to do some of these other acts. Whether it's talking with editors to make sure you're actually making sure they can edit and have the right permissions uh, for their own review process, whether it's trying to do extra UX and UI testing, uh, feedback from the current system, anything. So the single first big issue is stakeholder buy-in. And this is where you're going and you're doing, hopefully, grabbing any Google Analytics you have, UI and UX testing, um, feedback from alumni or corporate donors or anything like that who says some comment to you that says, hey, this is great. Hey, this is awful. Why don't you have this up? This company has it, why don't you? That sort of thing. Watching your hits once you clear out all the search engines and see you know, when are people coming to it? Are they staying on your pages? Um, especially if they're longer, really, busy pages, maybe they're skimming the top paragraph and leaving. So it's, that's when you start wanting to watch heat maps, everything like that. So whatever sort of data you can get, and even if you don't have exhaustive old Google Analytics, you can do a lot of the heat map stuff, drop on, get whatever you can before they push you off to say you have to do it by XYZ Live. But then the biggest issue is present it to these key stakeholders the way they respond. So if you have a graphical person, a very visualized visual person, like someone from architecture or a graphic artist, or a VP who used to be an arts major and she is now a, you know, a cutthroat accountant type, but figure out how they want to see it. Because it will differ on each person. I mean, you need to present it sometimes three or four different ways to get the buy into different meetings, different stakeholders, different points. Sometimes it is the spreadsheet. Here's the numbers. This is when we drop off because people stop looking after four pages, you know, things like that. Target them, whether it's stats, numbers. Sales and marketing guys love stories. They really do. Tell them why you want to do it. Tell them how people are using the site right now especially if you have been able to watch anybody use it, or like whether it's an e-commerce or what, just a general website, this is what we saw them doing, this is what happened, they didn't purchase because they weren't interested because of this. If you can roll that together, they buy it. And then initially, this is the biggest one, invite everybody. It's gonna suck at the first meeting or two, 
but get your big key stakeholders in at the beginning. You'd rather have them bow out and say, oh no, I'm not worried because they're in the process, they'll take care of it, or hey, we've got enough covering this area, I don't need to be here. But if you fail to invite someone who you didn't think was really gonna bother with it, and they might not have, but you piss them off, they can sink your project or anything that you ask for for time, money, resources. It's, like I said, those first few meetings, especially if it's gonna be a lot of folks, try to divvy them up, but include as many people as need to be there. And sometimes that takes asking up your org structure around who's with squeaky wheels, who needs to, who will have input, or knowing the people who have before who always come back with you, like, oh, hey, I know you sent this out, can we do this next time, or those sorts of folks. So just keep track of all those, keep them involved. And, but then stay benefits focused. So any of the ones that do that, make sure you're addressing what their needs are, uh, whether it's they're getting the color on, on a font they like, whether they are getting an email out to certain people in a way they like. There is still a small segment of one of our schools that loves doing e-newsletters that we've shown them. We know the 20 people that are opening these every time, can we just send it to them? And we'll do that because it's, you have to watch your audience, you have to watch your segments, you have to watch who you're working with and talk about the benefits for them. And if one of the pros on this is that, hey, you're getting better tracking data on who's coming to your site and what they're doing to you long term, you can then target them for that as well. So you just keep that in mind. It's easier to say, yeah, we'll give you this instead of no, we're not gonna give you something. It makes them feel better. And then the other thing is always make sure you do own up to the risk of the process. If you are going through a migration, you've got enough steps right there just for, this is what happens when the data gets mangled. You're pulling data out from somewhere else, running a bunch of regex on it, hoping the SQL loads in or CSVs go or anything else. That's one whole ball of wax right there. So if you're adding layers to it, which we are and we always will be, for UX, theming, possible other interactions that we're investigating, those are possible possibilities of something else to break be honest about it, most of them are pretty easily mitigated or not a big deal, but they'd rather say, hey, you've already thought about it than have something come up later in a small email and some notes, and they go, well, where did this come from? And it gets blown out of proportion. So you'd rather be more proactive on that again, same as the rest. Don't let it bite, it, bite you on the back end because you didn't bring it up before. And then start early. As soon as you know this is gonna happen, start rounding the horses up. I mean, get the carts in order, figure out what you wanna do, what's realistic, what manpower you have, what resources you'll have, how much new stuff you wanna push. Um, like if you're going from Drupal 6 to 8, or even 7 to 8, you know, some, you'll have to have folks who learn Twig versus uh, PHP template, you know, so there's that, uh, if you're doing custom customization. Um, it, whatever, it's just try to figure those out ahead of time. And knowing that list of yours will help. So editorial, content, and design. This is where kind of everything blends together because you have editorial, you have your content that's produced, you have your design. They each have their sort of silos, and yet they all, of course, always cross over. And this is where it leads to what are you gonna get out from your site migration and when is it worth it to you to actually push for some new things? So average site, roughly, for the top 200 sites, sticks around for about two and a half years. I think it was two years, seven months, 27 days was the average of the 200 top Alexa sites that they did the research on. Um, so the question is, is that in your industry, in your field, and in your, the way your site is, and your content and data, how much is worth your time and effort right now? In our field, we have recruitment that if we don't keep up with what students are doing for undergrads every six to eight months, we're gonna lose out to someone who wins. Uh, it's really easy to do that in person when they're giving talks to folks or talking about come and doing, um, you know, which program they wanna be involved in or which one's gonna be ex exciting or interactive for them. And we print small batches of handouts that mimic the content we have on, on the site. However, there's other interactions on the site which get, were killing us before. I've only been there two years back at, at College of Design and when we came in, the sites were horrid. I mean, they had, they'd had three or four different contractors and some folks on campus randomly helping. They hadn't had a steady supply of folks who knew what they were doing, and it was all janky. So students would come in, and if they came in through one school, they saw one path, they came in through another, they saw one, they came through instant admissions, they saw another. None of the information in the linking was consistent. Nothing was congruent, they got lost. So if it's only been six months since you've had some big uh, editorial revamp, you know, maybe it's not worth worrying about you know, what to do with the migration itself. Get that data moved on over, your structure's fine. Look at the surrounding stuff. If it's ancient or the editorial, like for ours, was horrible, not only were we clean, <laughs> cleaning house for the content, we were like, well, we're already doing this. Let's fix the rest of it because it's all changing anyway. So that, this is where some of the pros and cons you have to start weighing. But this is a good scale for your in, keep it track with your industry, but if it's more than about two years old, you probably need an editorial revamp, period. So let's go through some of the typical concerns when you say this to editors. They get scared. Most editors are great. They love their job. Some of them will pick up basic HTML because they know that way they can edit something, clean it up a little bit, 
You don't want them too far into styles, classes, whatever like that, but Bs, Is, closing stuff, that's wonderful. But they'll know it for the specific system they're on. They will get scared when suddenly you're changing the system they're used to. So this is one of the ones where you start early on and you talk to them, hey, we're gonna be looking at new systems. We'd like to get your feedback to see how either the current interface on the system works or what we could do to make it easier for you. Uh, we've done that, fortunately, again, with our editors and our what we call loose confederation in our schools and research centers, where we at least have a key person who's identified for providing this content so we can get this training and feedback because everything we're doing with them is gonna impact their deadlines, their current deadlines. All of ours, uh, our researchers don't have overhead costs built in for communications. So anything that we're asking them to do to give us news, events, can you do something more than just give us the white paper for the presentation you just did, comes from their time for their overhead from their projects. So we have to justify it really carefully and be really good use of their time because they have a lot of other concerns going on. But the key point, the great thing about that is they'll also know things that we don't because it's their areas of expertise. So when we're going and doing a, like a research center or a lab, they can tell us exactly who they're competing with, who they're trying to get funds from, and then we turn around and say, okay, cool. So we know this, this, and this, and these folks over here, and this one at this other institute are all going after the set of funds. How well do you interface with those guys or compete with or whatever? But for your funds, who are you talking to? And if it's a VP or a sales guy or someone else in general who kind of gets what's going on but isn't good on the technical skills, that feeds right back into our, what we need to do for editorial for tar doing that elevator speech, how to train them towards it, how to work on their content, which is one of those intangibles, but it does come back because they get more funding. We just got a great, great, great big grant because of simple uh, uh, elevator speech. Uh, so, and then discuss how this will be finalized though too because when they aren't sure what's going on and it's cutting into their time and their overhead, they wanna know what's gonna come out of it. So figure out, because if it's one of those where they don't care, it's quick and easy. If it's part of the job or something that they feel is attached to their research, it may be a big deal for them. So make sure they know who's gonna have the final say in all that. Or, or same thing with corporate, who's gonna, who's gonna be on the bottom line when they sign something. Excuse me there. And so this goes back to the whole, pro whole editorial process. You always wanna go in and make sure they realize how important they are to what's going on. Make them feel good. Everybody likes hearing that what they're doing is, is helping. If you do that with someone, especially who's not full-time communicator or editorial or anything else, they're just reviewing content or signing off on it, you're gonna have an easier time no matter what. But you also need to watch what they're doing. So like we literally had to sit there and went in and watch what people were doing with their research how they were publishing it, how they were sending it out. We told them just copy us on the emails, you're sending solicitations out, let us just see what you're saying, who you're sending to, how often. You know, we would just have a dump to a file and we could review and be like, okay, and you go in bursts or this one goes constantly, you're sending out the same thing. After six months, they've seen it four times, no wonder they're not responding, you know, that sort of thing. And, it's, and some do, they wanna see the exact same thing every time and know it's coming from this, this, this. Oh, I just need this to do X, Y, Z. So again, it's watching them, their workflow, their targets, but then teaching them that that even if they've been working with the same people for a long time, how they're getting this content is changing. Um, the stats is, you know, I think I went to this later too, is uh, over 65 is the single largest audience right now that is going with mobile devices. So a lot of these folks are on review boards, executive advisory boards, money pets, anything like that. They're making decisions, you need to target what they're used to seeing now. And it's changing. So it used to be send them out a card, send them out a pamphlet, send them out something like that. Now it's send them an email in the way they want to see it. And then this is where it gets into trying to make them more comfortable with all these changes. Make sure you train them. It doesn't have to be a lot. It doesn't have to be everything at once, but little by little. Basically, don't leave them behind. If you help bring them into what's going on, and it may take a while to train them on everything or even get them into a system for them to have the time to do it, but don't leave them hanging. That'll make them happy. But the good side is, what comes out of this? Well, you start talking to them saying, hey, we're doing it this way. We hopefully might have someone editorially who can kind of review the content because let's make sure we're not putting out stuff that sounds like, hey, a grad student wrote it here, a professor wrote it here, a development officer wrote it over here, a corporate exec wrote this, and it's all within one page or two pages of the same type of content. It looks incongruent, it makes you look unprofessional. Getting a little revamp style, and this is where an editorial style got helps too. Um, Georgia Tech has one, we have to revise it within the colleges too for our own vocabulary, but anything like this, the more you can put together for some guidance helps, and it gives good examples for it. There's plenty you can search on Google for examples of inconsistent voice and how bad it's, you know, when it comes off badly. Um, and targeted messaging. So this is the, what I was telling you with, uh, especially the researchers and funding. They didn't know how to describe their research in a way that someone who wasn't in their field could understand. Most of the funders might be in the general larger scope of their field, 
but they don't know your specifics. So we had the, the schools and the, and the researchers make a paragraph, a sentence, and a few keywords to describe what they do. And anytime they used a catchphrase from their field, we struck it and told them to come back, come back again. Uh, built environment was one I was using for building construction, city planning, all those. They would all use it different ways, but they would all use the same phrase. It made no sense. So we only let them use it once at the beginning of an article to find what it is, and then they had to reference it different ways from there on out. And suddenly they could say, oh, I can explain this now to someone, the, the guy that they were talking to because I have four more examples they can use instead of just saying built environment, and the people get it. It take, takes a while on that one, but it, it does break through on uh, the mentality when people are used to saying that. And then just perspective and clarity. A lot of these folks have been putting the same stuff out over and over and over for years, and they haven't had someone take a step back and say, hey, let's take a look at what you're doing. Um, so just seeing that, hey, here's the big picture. You don't have to just turn it all on. You can do it little by little. It helps them a lot. And it helps even more when someone's not in their field especially because you're trying to make sense of it too. So here's some training examples. So especially for online, these are obviously targeted for websites and online. Um, and even some point with um, print, because we do parallel a lot of that. Avoid italics and underline. They're much more difficult to read. Of course, they're kind of required in many, in many bibliographic formats. But it's, and it's not just for like dyslexia and anything like that. It's small fonts on phones, folks with bad eyes, low lighting. All these things come up. And again, this goes towards your target, ar target audience, where we have a lot of alumni that are over 50. They have eye issues. <laughs> I just finally had to start wearing glasses. Suddenly, everything started throwing off with me again. You know, it's all these things taken into account. This is just key things for them. Don't force justify text. It makes it hard for everybody to read. This is just horrible. Don't do it. Uh, avoid long, unbroken paragraphs. And you'll start seeing these. And when you start reading a few of these off, you'll see things start clicking in on people going, oh, yeah. They always, like on Quartz or Medium or anyone else, they've got the long form articles, but they're broken up into nice little chunks. They have a pull quote. They have a little picture. So it's never just block, 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 block. Here's your monograph. But that's very standard and abstracts for research. So as soon as you make them connect, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's perfect for this white paper and putting it on there in this one section of your site because you have to have the historical evidence for Google and your, and your researchers to find. But you don't do that in your news article. Don't do this on this thing that's this highlight for you just got this $30 million Candida award. You want to sort and sweet and make everybody happy with lots of pictures and short little blurbs, not here's everything that it's going to cover for the next 10 years. So it's just show them examples. And then sans versus serif. Of course, you'll have plenty of people, especially in the like, typographic and design community, but serif fonts with the little uh, extra pieces on the end work great at display and heading sizes, like at the top. Sans is much, much more legible in body text. Uh, the general rule of thumb, too, for body text as well is you stay around 16, uh, rel 16 pixels relative to the device uh, is a good baseline. 14 used to be a gimme sometimes on Android, but they've kind of upped it, too, to catch up. Um, 16 falls in with BCAG and everything as well. But Just some guidelines. And again, all these links will be available uh, with the slides when I post them. Um, another one. Alt texts. Thank you, Eric, for putting this one up the same time I found it the other day, too. It was wonderful. So accessibility is great. Explanations are great. But they need good examples. And this guy was like, hey, I know everyone's been training, and we've got some great people who do it out there, but let me show you how to do it from someone who has to read it and gives exact examples all the way through a page of how to do it, how not to do it, what happens, how it breaks apart. Never say, uh, he's got, I mean, he'll go through to you, but, you know, never say, image of a cute cat playing with a, with a leaf. You know, don't say, um, uh, was like, like a, of a group of students, don't say a group of students standing with scaring, staring into space. Well, it might be appropriate based on the content. Otherwise, it could be students deep in thought. It could be four students looking at the other one going, what'd you just do? So make sure it's context sensitive and give a description of the actual picture. Avoid image of, pick photo of, same thing like no click here's, all that. This is a great guide. It's hilarious to go through. I just only stole his one cute cat picture. Uh, so here's some other resources. I have to pimp AMAC because it's one of our research centers, so it's AMAC Accessibility uh, Solutions. Um, they do a lot of training, remediation, uh, device testing. So if you do have any special uh, accessibility concerns, whether you're EDU, receive federal funding, nonprofits, they have lots of resources, including with the, uh, the WAG group up here, so the Web Accessibility Group. They have a monthly meeting you can sign up for the notifications. They have a massive archive going back for years of all the recorded presentations. Um, basically, you know, how to use YouTube to kind of jumpstart your way to doing subtitles, but then go back and fix them. All that sort of stuff. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful resource. And then their general, like, one of the latest ones they would highlight with the top 10 tips for creating the accessible web content. Again, great video. It's held up for over the last two years because it's basic stuff. Writing for the web, uh, there's lots of, there's a bajillion open web courses uh, if you go search online. But these are a couple of good ones from, uh, there's a really good place, for, uh, I can't remember which Australian university has a lot of open courses too that are for web writing and uh, digital presentation. 
And then, um, oh yeah, culture shock. This is one of the MIT open courseware ones too. Same idea. Lots of just good resources, different perspectives. Uh, depending on your field, pick who you need to kind of counterpoint whatever you're used to versus what someone else might expect. You know, kind of ex extend your sphere. All right, so going in towards the design area. I loved this when I found this before. So I grew up in a physical world and speak English. The next generation is growing up in a digital world and they speak social. And it's not just, hey, I'm tweeting, or hey, I'm sending a text, or hey, I'm on here on Tinder, or whatever like that. It's how it affects the, the overall sphere of communications. Because what's up and coming, just like when beta and VHS were going on, and DVD and Blu-rays, or, or AC, uh, and AC DVD, it's what's gonna be coming next. That you may not have to worry about right now, but you have to prepare for it. So the, desi the design has to enhance the customer experience. So you wanna add to it, you wanna make it fun, but you still have to make it usable. Don't just throw something in there just to get their attention. Don't throw a slideshow in just because you want to show a whole bunch of pictures. There's always a, has to be a reason why you put something on there because that is your marketing material, is your content. And the mobile first design is actually important. There's a lot of folks who are used to, especially some designers who like making huge, big dis you know, displays for what they want the desktop or widescreen display to look like. And then they say, well, let me start taking it down. The problem is you don't take into account some of the issues that are limiting at the bottom of that first. I mean, you can always say, hey, sure, we'll drop a story off, we'll move this under here, stop doing this, but you'll run into something that you just, it doesn't work. So it is easier to start with mobile first, figure out the, those constraints and what you're adding to it, so the progressive uh, enhancement rather than degradation, and really work with it. And the great thing is, is that Google's now looking at this, essentially I think is as an Android 2.3 2 browser now, where it's running through acting like your site is running on Android with uh, CSS and JavaScript, and it checks for things like visibility and sizing. Are you outside of the viewport when it goes down to mobile sizes? And all of that affects your page rank. So especially if you're doing a migration and things are moving already and you might lose some points because of content changing, links changing, all that, last thing you wanna do is get yourself hit again for blowing up your layout or missing opportunities to enhance it at the same time. And again, audiences go back to, their, their access points are changing what they're expecting, what they're using, how they're finding their data, it's all been changing. Uh, we've literally watched our statistics change the last two years for uh, about a 30% shift in mobile devices. So from 25, 30% to almost 70% uh, for two of our audiences. And the oldest one right now was the 65 and up that's shifting. All right, so the design affects content. And this is where, I actually, uh, too bad I don't have handouts, but I've got examples. So the design sets your boundaries for what your content can do. They have to work hand in hand, they can't work apart from each other. Designs are wonderful when they come up with this huge, nice layout or you know, a nice tight thing, whatever, and you say, great, take the content from our live stories and stuff and let's go see how we break it. Um, and so we literally, and this is a little bit more about Google Texture Design with headers, we have literally walked through our editors and design folks and said, this is what we're moving towards, again, being the advantage of having been a small college to push stuff. This is what it's gonna look on the desktop. This is how it's gonna look on a phone. Plug in your data, plug in your sales, plug in your news, plug in your research, plug in your schools, all of those. See how it's gonna change, what's gonna affect, line lengths, what bylines drop off, what we're gonna highlight for them. And so this is the digital version of that where we're saying, hey, it looks great on a desktop like this with huge pictures. What's it gonna look like when it's down on here? How do we deal with it? What are gonna be the constraints for the titles? because uh, you know we're gonna have two line ones, how's it do? And so that way you get, the, you get the designers and the editors working together as soon as possible. Sometimes it's the same person. <laughs> Sometimes it's from two different departments, but especially if you're, you're gonna have to change something almost always on the theme level when you're doing a migration. So try to knock off as much as you can in the beginning. Uh, even if you're staying close to what the old theme was, stuff's gonna be changing. You know, the divitis for, for uh, Drupal 6 and 7 is largely gone with 8 because you can do it everything in a twig and a lot of it's cleaned up in core. That means your old theme and CSS were gonna change anyway. So, and other design tips. So these are both uh, trends for right now as well as, well, trends over the last couple of years and where everything's still going. Upgrade your, photo, uh, update your photographic assets. Everyone hates the same picture they've seen of the same students, the same people, the same whomever. Update them. Uh, it doesn't have to be all of them at once, but find those key people, those key pages where people land, keep those fresh, update those. Um, and again, and then on top of that, make sure they're big and targeted. So it's not just, hey, we have people from the company. It's like, no, really, this is our customer relations department, and this is on their support site. It's them. You know, it makes it feel tied with them. It may not be all of them, because some of them may leave, they change over, whatever like that, but when they see even a couple of names carrying over to support tickets or people involved, eh, 
that you seem relatively connected and updated. And again, design for your audience. Younger, recruitment, call to action stuff. You wanna keep it brighter. Um, Georgia Tech, we have old gold and white as our primary colors for eons and eons. Well, we realized with a couple of the uh, research groups, younger students want brighter. So it doesn't mean you get rid of those, you add something like a bright yellow that associates with buzz for us that gets their attention. So it doesn't mean you, you do away with branding or traditions, you just simply modify or add to them. And again, target it for them. While we still use the old gold and it's more, slightly more muted except for like homecoming and, and Thanksgiving and stuff for the alumni and professionals and our industry contacts and stuff. So audience appropriate. And then of course, <laughs> your loading time and white space. So they go hand in hand because good design, good loading time, good content is readable, which means you're gonna have white space to make sure you know, you're not butting your content against the edge of your phone. It's not gonna read as well. Put that little uh, 1M space on the sides, it's easier. You also have to keep an account that bootstrap and things like that are wonderful, but if all you're doing is for a grid layout, you don't need the whole freaking library. That's 200, 300K, and that's another second of load time. And if it's not cached because you guys aren't using the same CDN or anything else within your, within your group, every time that's coming down. So those add up. Uh, watching, doing the page load and the uh, Google tools and everything can be really eye-opening. And that all goes hand in hand because after two seconds on mobile, you've lost them. And then while you're doing all that, check the accessibility guidelines. Uh, WCAG 2.0, especially again if you see federal funding or anything like that. 2.1 uh, is coming around, but it's not big changes. It's mostly just clearing up a couple of the discrepancies, but check it. Uh, color contrast and your target sizes are the two big things. The 44 by 44 pixel target size for like links, so uh, like social icons, make sure it's big enough for your thumb to hit. That's really what you're doing. And then just legibility with the contrast. All right. So techno babble and geekery. So this is where we start going into modules, code, a couple like that. This is the fun stuff that's sometimes, sometimes fun, sometimes necess necessary for what we're doing. So general SEO when you're migrating sites. Go to HTTPS. If you're not, plan it. If you planned it, go ahead and get it done. Uh, it drastically affects your rankings with Google. Uh, one of the things we just did in the last year and a half is we just changed our name from College of Architecture to College of Design because we also have the School of Architecture under us, so we had the New York, New York problem of architecture, architecture and didn't really represent the other schools that we had anyway. So when we did that, it's us against SCAD, who's had design in their name up here forever. I did everything I could to game Google, and we got pretty good. I'll go through a couple of things too. Uh, so we went to HTTPS, we redirected everything, we cleaned up stuff, bad links had been around for years, other ones that were repetitive, just anything we could, we did. Um, you can get, you have to watch out for the 301s though too, because you can kind of get yourself in a referral circle if you've got one page that someone else has redirected, you didn't realize, and it's maybe on your site, but it's not a hard one yet. So keep track of it, um, but, and that's when you can grab the XML and the site maps and the, and the link lists from Google and Bing tools. We'll use those, if you don't have them, make accounts at both Google and Bing, even though Google far outweighs it, Bing is number two. Get them both. Uh, and again, Google has a mobile response checker, and they do use that. It, it went in effect this last year, it does affect your results. On top of that, not only with your mobile checker, drop in an AMP type thing, or AMP responsive, and I forgot the link for that one here, but I'll add it before I post the slides. It does, it does help you. I literally watched our results go up several points between when we went through HTTPS, added our AMP, uh, responsive themes, all of those. And I did it using these tools. So the Google and Bing web, uh, web tools, um, Xeno Link Sleuth is a great way for you to catch anything really, really quickly before Google indexes you, and so that's for Windows. Integrity is a, is a Mac version doing the same thing. It just does link checking, lost assets, unlink stuff, everything. So it's a funny side story to all this. When you do update a lot of pages, so if you have the pages at the same URL, you kind of have this sort of freshness rating. You get it heard lots of different ways, fresh rank, whatever like that, depending on who you're talking to. So you like having an established domain, you like having the established paths, you like having these generally updating content. Well, if you have a page that's sat there for a while and you only kind of tweak, hey, we're doing it on Thursday this week instead of Friday, or next quarter we're doing this, and that's all it really changes, you, you kind of only get a small bump. If you change a chunk of the content, but it's still in line with what it expected to be there, then it helps bump you up. So like if you're always talking about dogs or adopting or something like that, and you're simply updating the list of, the, of dogs or procedures, all of those help. If you have something come in, such as a professor whose name is Michael Gamble, and you suddenly have 10 pages, a whole bunch of PDFs and leaked documents, all who start saying gamble, 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 Google may flag you <laughs> and say, hey, you might have been hacked. 
It took us three weeks into the semester to figure out what the heck they were talking about because they wouldn't consistently flag us in the Google Webmaster tools. So it's things like that that you don't know you're going to run into this at all. They'll just come up. That's the first time in all these years I've ever had an instance like that simply because of his name. So there's going to be those odd cases. Just go back and check your tools, especially when you're migrating. Do it like every few days. On a normal procedure, just do it you know, every couple weeks just to see if anything flags. We, that was a long email response, Shane. So for, Google, for Drupal itself, when you're doing some of these SEO and migrations, if you want to check all of your aliases, these are two ways to do it. Uh, of course, you can pull the stuff down from Google and Bing to make sure they all align there too, because of course they will index differently at times. Uh, again, this will be posted up, and you can find examples of these all over uh, Stack Overflow and stuff. But if you're a database type guy, go to the first one. You can select everything from the table, dump it out to a file, boom, you have a quick reference for which node, what, what the path was. You can also then see if something else is there. You can also do this from the redirect table as well instead of just the path alias table. And that way you can say, hey, okay, this is really going over to here. Do I just need to remap it once or does it make a sense to keep redirecting something else? Uh, and that's just part of the beforehand, after, and afterwards with the migration, take care of it. The other way is with Drush. And with all the updates to Drush, you should be in like eight, Drupal, a Drush 8.1.4 and below will always work on everything right now. Um, specific modules, of course, Path Auto, Google Analytics, Meta Tag. These are all, if you're not using them on a Drupal site, do it. Meta Tag, while you're not sitting there and going to be doing, worrying about keywords and everything else being exactly bumping up your Google ratings, you want to specify your defaults for uh, organic groups, for the Facebook uh, tagging, for Twitter, for anything else where you say, hey, I want this image here. Maybe it's setting up an image uh, resizing set of series, so that way you take your main image or hero image from your page, automatically cut it down. Um, I'll drop in the link to on here for when I post them. Uh, there's a great guide that basically gives you every social <laughs> media re uh, resolution you need, and you kind of then kind of groups them and says, okay, if you do this one, it'll work for these five. This will work for these, because Facebook's uh, ratio is different from Tumblr's, is different from others. But that way, when they post them, you don't end up with something like where you've got BBC. Uh, dot com, where sometimes you get a great picture and sometimes you get the little one from down on the bottom right. That's an unrelated story, but it got carried over because of the keyword. And so that's how you get around that. So logical defaults for those when you're updating. And that way, when you're importing or putting in your content, you have same defaults that then you can override. And there's lots of good documentation on all of these for putting in those defaults, carrying them over, what they are from reading from your tags, your pictures, all like that. Redirect and redirect 404 is another great one. This is where obviously. Uh, depending on how you're doing your redirects, if you have good permanent ones that you're doing on an HT access file or Apache or Nginx or whatever stuff, you don't need to worry about some of them. But if you have editors going in, you don't want them worrying about that an HT access file and broken your whole site. So this way they can redirect one. Or that way when they change a URL, it automatically puts a redirect in. Both are options. And the redirect 404 and search 404 are other options for like, hey, it's unfound. Let me go see if I can find something for you to give you close. And of course, Google Analytics, you need a path auto, same like uh, meta tag, sets you up a lot of good defaults for your path aliases and stuff. Uh, now for general UX, again, applicable to everything. LQIP or LQIP, yeah, I thought I had these all together, sorry about that, and, and intrinsic, intrinsic, intrinsically sized images. So what this does, intrinsic si ratios is wonderful. It lets you have a page draw and you don't have to have all your images loaded, but it doesn't have it jumping around on you afterwards. So all it is, it does a little padding trick with CSS, puts a padding bar, a margin padding bottom, whichever, um, and it holds that position. So that way, as your image loads later, you don't have the content here, and then suddenly it pushes down on someone while they're reading, makes them upset, they get frustrated. And then LQIP does the low quality image placement. And some of the new ones that were the couple first ones that are in here just came out where they're using SVGs to do it. And so that way, that's when you did like the pixelated ones that then swap over when the picture loads. They've also got ones that now do the S, um, SVG tracing. So it gets them even smaller doing it and injects it. So. Again, those are kind of fun. It's good stuff to play with. The ultimate result is you have a better UX user experience. So whichever you go with is going to be better than what you have, on almost likely in any, in any instance right now. Uh, and then intrinsic ratios, that's a good little CSS tricks link for you. That'll explain it to you. You basically come up with paddings for all of them. Um, you know, we, we end up using the 16 by 9 uh, is a really obviously common one for your, pic or for your photographs. So you build that in as your common default. So you put in intrinsic padding on stuff, and Aardvonk that holds that. Then we only overwrite it if it's not going to be a 16 by 9. So if it's going to be a square one, or if it's going to be uh, like a three to one, ni nice like long rectangular one to get your attention up top, but still allow the your data to come up like for an archive or something like that, versus maybe a hero one where it's a four to one ratio. So, but there's, it's, it gives you a good place to start with. And then progressive web apps are something that, it's one of those, because it's just kind of coming into vogue, a lot of people have a different idea of what they do. So 
the basics of this is really, really simple to drop in your site and get a lot of fast wins. It's sort of like back when you first had uh, the different fave icons and the manifest and stuff like that to make sure your site showed up on like Web TV and Xbox and Windows and stuff like that, or Windows 8, with the right tile, the right color, the right link, so it looked more professional. You can do offline browsing, uh, browser caching and that same idea with Windows 10 coming up as a first, looking like a first party application for two lines of script. And it's, it's simple. Uh, it's, that's a great link that leads you to about four or five other articles that will go into depth. But it's really, yeah. Yeah, but it's like using service workers and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Um. And I probably haven't played around with people enough to know this, but, but like, where would you drop in that stuff? Like, or, you know, register your service workers with like a Drupal architecture. Normally, I've been doing it through the theme level JavaScript, okay. and doing it on that level just because then I can have it interact with the actual theme elements as well as the images, and say, hey, start it with this, and then put this in your cache, then allow it to, to load in the background, and that's when you can, can kind of combine these. So you start with a low image placement have it cache in on the back end, so then it's, all, it's also offline as well for your, for your service worker. Okay. Have it checked there, oh, I've got this one, but not the other three the next time you're online type thing. Okay. And so that, that's just that interface right there. It, you, can't, I, you should be able to push it all the way back further, I just haven't played with that yet. That's okay. part of the decoupled stuff that we were talking about. Yeah. So, and this is, here we go, there's just a tweet showing it. This was, it was just announced last month, so that's why. It's, you know, it just makes everything look nicer. Android, Firefox, everyone's putting it in. It will show up as a better app that makes it look like you have a better full experience that for very, very little work. So sometimes it's easy gotchas, or easy things. So anyway, that's about right at time for it. So we've got about five, eight minutes for questions. Anybody? Any more coffee first? All right, well, thank you all for coming out, especially in a Friday. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. So if you are migrating a non-Drupal site, uh, what are the steps you take? Uh, what do you do first and what are the you know? Usually, the, it will, really depends on where you're coming from, but the very first thing I do is I make a backup, complete backup, and that way it's, it's exactly snapshot what it is. Figure out all the links from Google and Bing, and then I figure out how I'm going to map the content. If the content's one-to-one, -one, if, if we're keeping the exact same architecture and everything, or are we changing up? And then that goes back to how old is the content. Um, but it really depends on how you're getting the content from the old site. Because even from some of our old Drupal sites, it's not worth doing a one-to-one -one mapping with migrate because we're having to scrape from stuff that doesn't have a migrate path. So like from WordPress, we've had a bunch that moved over from WordPress, and there's an actual WordPress import for migrate that works pretty well. There's also the other way that if you're kicking it back out, you can put so much more information than WordPress knows what to deal with. So having an idea of the target helps, but generally I would say really figure the first things are the backup, the link structure, and figure out what content's going together as you migrate. And it's kind of on a page scale. And there, I mean, we've even dirty hacked at the times where it was so screwed up on an old system that instead of trying to figure out how to pull it out individually or through their export tools, we literally used curl to pre-process, strip out their theme, pull just the content from the middle, and inject it to a new page, because it was so much easier to start that way, and then actually re-export it, do some regex to clean up the SQL and put it back in, just because it saved time. Uh, so at least it wasn't copy and paste, it was at least bulk copy and then tweak. So, and if you have an example, I'd be happy to talk with you about it later. Anything else? All right, well I will post these slides uh, with a couple of the uh, extra links I was talking about and they'll be uh, on the Drupal camp and on Twitter with the tag. So feel free to send me uh, my emails up there or uh, tag me and I can get you any answers too. So thank you.